Good morning. Good morning. How are you today? Great. Good. Good. There's some people. Did we? Do we have some people in here that weren't here yesterday? Let's see. See hands. I thought so. Yeah. You were slow in saying yes. <laughs> I'm not going to make you do anything. Just thought I saw some new faces. Woo. Uh, wanted to find out how your prayer sessions went yesterday. Was it was it good? Yeah, yeah. You you look better today. <laughs> it's amazing what prayer does. You know, we could talk about this forever, but when you really get down to the praying, how many of you felt kind of a, a new indwelling presence uh, when you were prayed over? Just kind of a yeah, yeah. The Holy Spirit was so present yesterday. It's interesting, one of the things I've found out over the years, and my husband and I both feel this, and Linda, uh, it's when, when you honor God and you really welcome the presence of the Holy Spirit, or even the holy angels, they really show up. You know, they just, uh, they really do come in response to our need and our prayers. So we want to do more of that today and uh, get you praying together for healing. Okay, today's going to be on healing, and I'm going to be talking about uh, starting the four types of healing. But I'd like you to join hands, and let's pray together. If you can't reach the person, don't worry about moving chairs or killing yourself, just kind of intentionally. And just take a moment, like we did yesterday, and pray for the people around you whose hand you're holding, and just ask the Lord to bless them today. And then surrender yourself as best you can. Father, we do welcome you into this wonderful sacred place. Uh, this ground is made holy by your presence. Lord, we welcome you. We welcome the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. We just ask and uh, seek your anointing for this day, especially, Lord, on this subject of healing. Lord, we pray that uh, we will learn from you all day long not only in the teaching, but in the prayer times and the times of fellowship. Lord, we pray, we know we've come here to learn about you and about serving you in your kingdom, but we pray also, Lord, for an anointing for healing for each one in their body and mind and spirit. Lord, that whatever they've uh, brought with them, that they'll be able to really place in your care today. Lord, we love you, we trust you, we pray that we will be protected by you this day and all those that we love. Lord, just give us a wonderful time, a joyful time of sharing together the good news of the kingdom. So thank you, Jesus, for being our great Savior, great Redeemer, and great Healer. Help us, Lord, to become like you in every way. We thank you. Amen. Amen. Okay. Well, I'm going to try and uh, <clears throat> have some time throughout the day for you to ask questions. If there's, I have any questions, have a little bit more of interactive. Yesterday, I really wanted to get through the, kind of the parts on the Holy Spirit. Uh, This, this is, in my mind, the best book on healing that's ever been written <laughs> by Francis McNutt, whoever he is. <laughs> and uh, I have to tell you kind of a funny little story. My teaching that I'm giving today, most of, a lot of it is coming out of this wonderful, wonderful, just amazing. Francis has an ability, which I so... It, I know we're not supposed to envy, but I do envy this ability that he has. He can take the most complex subjects and make them so understandable. 
like his book on deliverance is just being used in seminaries around the world. His little book, The Prayer That Heals, is extraordinary. I use that in my private practice with couples and marriages that, you know, that needed help. There's just a tremendous, he has this tremendous ability. Uh, Randy Clark and Bill Johnson and everybody out there, John Wimber said everything he learned about healing, he learned from Francis. As I said, you know, we've been doing this 100 years, so there's some collective wisdom. Uh, but anyway, uh, when I was uh, running this house of prayer in Jerusalem, it was a house of prayer and reconciliation, uh, that's when I first started getting really involved in a deeper level. I had prayed when I was working in psychiatric hospitals in Boston uh, for my patients. That's where I really started praying for healing. But uh, when he came to speak, he was with Catherine Kuhlman and Pat Robertson and Jamie Buckingham and just some of those great names from, you know, 100 years ago, feels like. But uh, one, one copy of this was left in Jerusalem, and I got it. <laughs> and uh, I would just loan it out to people, you know, when they'd have to give me a $100 deposit or something. <laughs> and, uh, I wish I had that book now because every single person that read it, because we were all getting involved in healing, they all wrote in the book up and down the sidelines and, you know, well, I don't know about this, but this sounds good. And, you know, it was just such a exciting time, like for some of you that are just getting involved in healing. But he really, we had the Bible in one hand and this book in the other hand as we prayed for people. So I really wanted to recommend this uh, Part of what we're doing here is trying to, you know, train you, get you healed, but train you how to do this. And uh, it's so limited in what we can do in three days, of course. So resources are going to be very important for you. And uh, as I said, this is one of the, the top ones. There's some, most of these people that have written, Mike Flynn, others out there, Bill Johnson, there's so many, John Wimber, they're all our friends and we just endorse all of them in their healing ministries. But how many of you, I want to kind of get an idea of the group now that we're going to talk about healing. How many of you have ever prayed for someone out loud with them? I don't mean, you know, in your home and they're a thousand miles away, although that's good too. But how many of you have prayed with someone face to face for physical healing? Let me see your hands. Yeah, that's great. Great. Now, how many of you saw a healing take place after you prayed? See your hands. See, the numbers always go down a little bit, and that's okay. As I said, John Wimber prayed a whole year before he saw a healing take place in his church. And that should encourage all of us, shouldn't it? Not get discouraged, because it's not us. It's up to God when he moves. Now, how many of you have ever prayed for someone for inner healing? Let me see your hand. Healing of memories, emotions. And you've seen a healing. Keep your hand up. Let's see. Yeah, that's good, that's good. Now this number usually drops a little bit on the next question. How many of you have prayed for deliverance from evil spirits with someone? Yeah, it goes down, but that's still very good, very good showing. And you actually saw something happen. Yeah, good, good. How many of you prayed for spiritual healing for someone? Now that's good, because a lot of people say, what is spiritual healing? You know, so we're going to be, you've probably done it and you didn't call it that, okay? So what we're going to do is talk about those four kinds of healing. And uh, throughout the next period will be physical healing, then this afternoon will be uh, evil, yeah, dealing with evil, spiritual warfare, not deliverance, but spiritual warfare. And then tomorrow will be more on inner healing. Okay. I touched on some of this yesterday, but I want to go over. It's those four kinds that we're talking about. The first three areas, physical healing, inner healing, and spiritual healing, those are the three areas of our humanity. If you want to think about it that way, mind, body, spirit. Mind, body, spirit. The three areas of our humanity. Now, the fourth area of healing... Uh, deliverance is basically dealing with uh, the demonic, evil spirits, uh, evil, uh, the evil one, however you want to understand that. 
But we're all broken in some way or another. And that brokenness is on two levels. And we need a savior. That's why Jesus came. Jesus came to bring healing. Jesus came to bring us salvation, however you want to understand that, uh, through the cross. He came to bring us eternal life through the resurrection. But what Jesus, what's so important to me as I read scripture is not only what did Jesus say, but what did he model? Models are very important uh, in our lives. Like all of you grew up with someone as a parent, um, step parent, orphanage, something. All of you had models in your life. Models speak louder than words, always. And so when we look at the life of Jesus, we have to say, what did he model? And of course, what he modeled was compassion and love and mercy and healing and deliverance. Anytime there was anyone that was sick, anytime there was anyone that was possessed, he went after them. He would stop whatever he was doing and pay attention. If a funeral was passing by, he would stop the procession and give life to the person. You know, so wherever Jesus went, he brought life. That's what's so incredible about him. He infused every situation with life. Hope, mercy, forgiveness, all of that. And so I want to be like him. That, that's just my simple way of saying it. I want to be like him. I want to reflect his love, his life, his glory. I want to be able to reach people that are suffering. And if we go to Isaiah 61, which I'll talk a lot about tomorrow, my husband calls Isaiah 61, Jesus is state of the union. <laughs> and I like that. You know, like in the Gospel of Luke is where Jesus stands up and he's handed, as a young rabbi, he's handed the scroll of Isaiah. And he reads it. And then he said, this day, this has come true in your hearing. And he said, I've come to bring the good news. I've been anointed, so I'm bringing the good news. Not good advice. I learned as a therapist, no one listens to advice. They'd pay me money to come to me and they wouldn't listen to me. I just always thought that was hysterical, you know. I was okay with that if they didn't want to listen. But Jesus came to give us good news. What is the good news? It's the news of the kingdom. The enemy is being defeated. Death is being conquered. Resurrection is possible. You know, all this, you're loved by God. God wants to show you love and mercy. That's the good news. Come to bind up the brokenhearted. That's, that's inner healing right there. Uh, all inner healing is, is uh, dealing with people that are brokenhearted. I've come to set the captive free. Open prison doors. That's the ones that are under the power of the enemy. That are oppressed or depressed or possessed. You know, so all of these things, that's Jesus' mission. And when we try and take those things away from the message of Jesus, we end up with an impotent church. We end up with a church that can no longer operate in the power of the Holy Spirit. When we take those things out of the message of Jesus Christ, uh, and what really concerns me, I didn't say this yesterday, but it just ran across my brain, I, I think in so many ways, and, and I'm not talking about any one denomination, please don't go and say Judith said this about the Anglicans or the Episcopalian, because I say this everywhere I go. We have really domesticated the Holy Spirit. We've really domesticated him, you know, to a license plate. And One of my favorite little stories on this, I heard Brendan Manning tell this, uh, St. Paul, or Paul, was in New York City, modern day, and he's walking around, and he's looking for the place where the Christians are meeting. And he walks up to all these people, different people, and he says, where's the body meeting? And of course, they 
Like it's a tattoo parlor or something, you know, where's the body? Nobody knows what he's talking about. And finally, he's, one man says, oh, you mean the church? And he said, yeah, yeah, where's the, where's the churches? He said, oh, go right down that street. He said, there's like 10 on that street, and you can take your pick. And so Paul picks one, walks in. They hand him uh, the bulletin when he walks in the door. And Paul says, what's this? And uh, the man says, what's well, the order of service? And Paul says, how do you know what the Holy Spirit's going to do? <laughs> Isn't that a good one? You know, I just think there's something in that that we have so domesticated and so controlled and so defined what Sunday should look like, and not to even mention the other days. You know, so there's an interesting scripture that I want to read to you and kind of talking along these lines before we talk specifically on the types of healing. 2 Timothy 3, five says, They will keep up the outward appearance of religion, but will have rejected the inner power of it. Isn't that interesting? And that's talking about the future, uh, which we're in now. This was central to the message of Jesus Christ. Healing was central to Jesus. Acts 10.38. It's one of my favorites. God had anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and power. Isn't that beautiful? And he went around healing everyone who had fallen under the power of the devil. Isn't that powerful? So he anointed him with the Holy Spirit and power. So in order to do this work, we have to be anointed. And it has to be through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not in our own strength. I've never healed anyone. Francis has never healed anyone. It is Jesus Christ who heals through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, the thing about Jesus, one of the many thousands of things I love about Jesus, is he loved to give healing away. He loved to use ordinary people, didn't he? First he had the twelve, and he anointed them. Matthew 10, 1, and Luke 9, 1. He called his twelve disciples to him and gave them authority. He gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. Isn't that exciting? And then, when that wasn't enough, he called the 70, or the 72, depending on where you're reading it, and gave them authority. The same authority. And they went out, and it says that when they came back, they were shouting for joy. And just think, if, you, if, you, if I said right now, there's more than 72 in here, we're just all going to go out into the streets. And we're going to lay hands on people. We're just going to walk up down the streets and lay hands on people. And every single person got healed. How would you feel? See, that's the way they felt. They came back. And that, that particular one, it says that Jesus, the King James Version, when they were reporting this, the King James Version says that Jesus was moved in his spirit. And the original says he jumped up and down for joy. <laughs> now, what a difference. Our little British, you know, inheritance there. <laughs> Every, I know, he's not in here, is he? I don't think. <laughs> He'll hear it, though, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. But it, it's, it's just, we see, yeah, Francis and I minister a lot in England. We love England, and our daughter's gone to college there twice. I was telling him, she's like her second home. But, you know, we, th this is what we have in the King James. It's very muted. It's very muted, isn't it? You know, that's why I like to read Peterson out of the message sometimes. But, you know, Jesus said, I saw Satan falling like lightning from heaven. You know, in other words, that the, the enemy is being destroyed. Remember what I said? Every time you pray, you're pushing back that darkness. You're pushing back the kingdom of Satan, ushering in. That made Jesus really happy. You know, so when we pray for someone, God is very pleased. This is what he wants. He's trying to let us recapture our inheritance. Okay, because it, it's your inheritance. 
as a child of God to be able to pray for people and they'll be restored. That's your inheritance. Okay. Don't you wonder, this is something, these are the conversations Francis and I have. Whatever happened to those 72 people? Now, do you think about that? Whatever happened to them? Like, did they keep that anointing? And everywhere they went, people were healed? It's like with the resurrection of Jesus. One of the scriptures that blows me away, and I ask everybody, every theologian I meet about it, what about all those people who came out of their graves and walked around Jerusalem? <laughs> Did you ever think about that? Oh, hi, Mom. You know, there's... <laughs> Like, did, did they go back to their graves, or did they go to heaven, or did they just go and, and spread the kingdom, you know? They left out so much <laughs> that I want to know about. I really want to know more about these subjects, you know? But those 72 people, we don't even have their names. We don't know who they were. They were ordinary people, just like us. And God anointed them and used them for healing. And then in the book of Acts, you know, we've got... Peter, Philip, Paul, all of them in the temple, healing cripples, restoring sight. It's just in incredible. And up until the third century, when Christians were baptized, and into the fourth century, third and fourth century, they were being used for healing. Ordinary Christians were being used for healing. And then it kind of went underground. And of course, as I said, Francis's book, The Healing Reawakening, really explains that, and I, I won't go into that today. So anyway, conversions were massive in Rome due to healing. That's the reason. And casting out demons. And this has been well documented in the history of the church. And then suddenly, this, this changed. And then it was only at holy places with holy people places like Lourdes and places like that where, do you know 5,000 people a day go to Lourdes in the summer in France seeking healing? Isn't that extraordinary? Now think about it. And large numbers of those people are from America. They'll rent whole jumbo jets and fly over there in the summer. And they could be healed right in their own church. Now, isn't that ironic? We have a healing center. We wouldn't have a healing center if the church was doing this. Isn't that interesting? I'd be out of work. <laughs> no, I'm ready for that. <laughs> I'll just go pray with people. Yeah. Okay, let's look at these kinds of healing. I just really want to emphasize to you that, you know, you don't have to have special anything. You just have to have a love for God and a love for people. And just be an ordinary Christian. Uh, one of the things John Wimber used to say was, everybody gets to play. Yes. Everybody gets to play. And uh, uh, when we were speaking at John's church in Anaheim one time, our children were like 8 and 10. And uh, he gave us these t-shirts that says, doing the stuff. <laughs> and uh, that's the first question John asked when he went to a church. You know, he was not a Christian, he was in the rock band, and he was, he's got a great testimony. It's one of the funniest testimonies I've ever heard, if you ever get to hear his testimony. It's, it's on a CD or DVD. But anyway, uh, he went to church, and all they did was kind of the bulletin, you know. And at the end of it, he was outside smoking a cigarette, trying to find an ashtray at a church, which is another funny story. And he walked up to the deacon and he said, no, when are you going to do this stuff? And the deacon said, what are you talking about? And he said, you know, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons. Because that's what he had been reading in his Bible. And the deacon said, oh, we just talk about that now. <laughs> so that's one of John's famous lines. So he has these t-shirts made up doing the stuff. And Francis and I and our two children got those t-shirts. John gave them to us. We were walking around. I remember Julia in California. It's kind of an apple center where apples are raised and great apple pies. And here we are, the six-foot-four guy and me and the two kids, and it says, are you doing the stuff? 
And I can't tell you how many people came up to us. It was a great testimony. And said, what's the stuff? <laughs> I said, healing the sick, raising the dead, casting out demons. And they go, okay. <laughs> They'd walk away very quickly, yeah. <laughs> and she's strange, they're strange, yeah. We had great fun with that. Rachel and David wore them proudly then, now you couldn't get them on them, you know. It's, they change as they grow up. <laughs> Sophisticated. Okay. Now, I want to say a few things uh, about these four areas that I've mentioned. You know, three are in our humanity, and the third one is uh, deliverance from evil. Uh, all of these are interrelated. One of the um, mistakes, I'll call it, that we've made in, in the healing ministry is we have uh, isolated these areas of healing into specific, specific ministries. Like Oral Roberts was known for physical healing, wasn't he? Uh, Catherine Kuhlman was known for physical healing. Uh, Agnes Sanford was known for inner healing or healing of the memories. And it kind of goes on like that. What we try to do at Christian Healing Ministries is bring the four together. And Chris Francis wrote about this 40 years ago in that book, Healing. The four types of healing and bringing them all together. Because you will rarely pray with someone that just has one area of healing that they need. For instance, and I'll talk with you a little bit about the interview. When a person comes for prayer, like at Christian Healing Ministries, we book every appointment for 90 minutes. And of course, we don't charge for these appointments because it's for prayer, and we have volunteers that do it that have been through all four levels, most of them, of our schools of healing prayer, where they've really learned how to do the stuff. You want to say it that way? So the interview is very critical, no matter, and of course this can't be done in a healing service, but the interview should last 20 to 30 minutes because you're listening to the person. Even if it's someone that comes in with a bad back, there can be roots in the emotions. There can be roots in the demonic, the spirit of infirmity. There can be unforgiveness. You know, so the interview is incredibly important. And when we're interviewing someone, it's good just to ask a few questions. You know, it's not like a therapist, like I would do. But, like, when did this problem start? And how long have you had it? How severe is it? Did anything happen around that particular time that could have caused this problem? Well, I remember one woman said, my husband did leave me <laughs> around that time, and I got this crippling arthritis right after that. You know, so what was going on in the person's life at that time? And most people will present with a physical problem instead of an emotional or inner problem because it's easier to talk about. You know, I have a pain in my neck. Well, it turns out that's their adult child, you know. <laughs> it's, it's right there in their neck, you know, and they can't get rid of it, you know, until they deal with their pain about, their emotional pain about their adult child. So I think you understand that. It's, the interview is very important. There's deeper roots of infirmity or sickness almost always. And uh, the good news is, when we're operating in the gifts, we're trusting the Holy Spirit to reveal those deeper. It's not like we need hypnosis or deep analysis. Uh, we're trusting the gifts of the Holy Spirit that we talked about yesterday to be operative. One thing God always does to me is he'll say, when it gets to a part of the story, he'll say, pay attention. Pay attention. And I'm like, okay. And the presenting problem, as we call it in psychology, is rarely the one that we end up praying about. You know, because the Holy Spirit will go to the deeper level, uh, to, the, to the one that's accurate. Now, all of you, is there anybody in this room who's never been to a doctor? We've all been to a doctor. 
70% of people that go to see a doctor never receive an accurate diagnosis. And you're all going, yes, I know that. Because you know, you've all been to doctors. Now, I'm not down on doctors. We train doctors. We work in hospitals. We train chaplains. I've worked in hospitals. Francis was a medic in the Army. We love medicine. I'm very thankful for Advil if prayer doesn't take a headache away, or antibiotics if there's an infection. You know. But the reality is that 70% of people that go never get a diagnosis. It's also interesting, on the other side of that coin, 70% of all illness is psychogenic. It originates somewhere in our emotions, in our memories, in our experiences. So isn't it interesting, now those are not my numbers, those are documented studies, that both numbers are the same. So when somebody says to me, a doctor can't diagnose what's wrong with me, that gives me some information, doesn't it? Practical information. But you know that when you go in, I remember one time I had this pain, like it was like an abdominal pain, but it didn't hurt unless I pressed. And I went in to see this doctor, and he put me through every test imaginable. And, you know, $5,000 later, he said, I have no idea what it is, just don't press there anymore. I could have done that, you know, and saved $5,000 or saved the insurance company $5,000. You know, so my point is a diagnosis is incredibly important. You will never get the treatment you need for an illness unless you have an accurate diagnosis. And a good doctor will not prescribe a medication to say, let's see if this works. You know, they'll try and narrow it down. A psychiatrist, same way for an antidepressant or something, other, you know, psychiatric medication. Our whole goal is to get a diagnosis. When I was a little girl, I became very, very sick. Just high fever, flush, just felt horrible. I still remember how bad I felt. I was a little girl, but I remember it so well. Another little hint I'll give you is trauma seals memories very powerfully within us. And so for me, that was a trauma to be that sick. I was really worried about my life. And my mother was even more worried. You know, and this little doctor next door that I grew up with, he helped, you know, deliver me. He came over, he kept coming over and kept coming over. And he said, I have no idea what's wrong with her. She's really sick. My mom said, I know that, you know. <laughs> so they were kind of, you know, and she was worried. But finally, I don't know, it was the second or third day, I broke out in measles. And this doctor came over and said, well, I'll be damned, it's measles, like that. And my mother said, leave this room right now, because <laughs> he used a bad word. <laughs> we were not allowed to use bad words in my home. As a matter of fact, if my mother was in here and heard me say that, she'd wash my mouth out with soap. <laughs> she did one time, that's all it took. But so a diagnosis is so incredibly important. So when you're listening to someone... Jesus, when he prayed with someone, made an accurate diagnosis of their situation. It was always, and I wanted to give you a scripture on that. Matthew eight sixteen and 17. It says, when evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him, and he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all the sick. This was to fill, fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and carried our diseases for us. Of course, it's Isaiah 53. Now, notice the differential diagnosis. Some problems were dealt with by exorcism, when the cause of sickness was demonic, and others by healing, when the cause of the sickness was natural such as a broken bone, sickness, or a sickness caused by germs. So you had a differential diagnosis. The very same sickness can be caused either by natural causes or by the demonic or by a combination of both. For example, with one man who was mute, this is in Luke eleven fourteen, Jesus cast out a spirit. At another time, when a man who could not hear 
Jesus put his fingers in his ears and said, Ephata, be opened. And his ears were opened by a healing. At another time, the gospel says Jesus was healing, quote, painful complaints of one kind or another, the possessed, uh, the paralyzed, this is in Matthew 2, 24, epileptics. The gospel writers seem to be making distinctions between different kinds of ailments. See, there's a differential diagnosis going on. This is, this is of practical importance to us because most people in the healing ministry tend to oversimplify things. I've had people say to me that are ministers, all cancer is demonic. All epilepsy is caused by demons. You know, and I, I try not to argue with them. I try to, you know, have a reasonable conversation at that point. The reason they can back that up is maybe on one occasion what they prayed worked. And they make it a principle. You know, I know a woman that was very well known that was healed of cancer and it was through deliverance. And therefore, every time she dealt with cancer patients, she would pray deliverance and it wasn't always right. That's why going back to the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the sermon is so important, word of knowledge, all of that operating with the gifts of healing. I hope you understand that because it's really important. The diagnosis is incredibly important. Okay, I had a, Francis and I were speaking one time uh, at a conference and they asked if they could bring this young man to us who everyone in the church was convinced he was possessed. And uh, I, I could hear him coming at a distance, and they, they were pulling him to us, just these, these, his parents and the pastor, and we sat down in a room, and they gave, gave us a little history, and before we prayed with him, and this is important too, we prayed and asked the Holy Spirit, what is this, and what do you want us to do? You know, never rush in and lay hands on someone. And the Lord said, uh, it's not demonic. It's not demonic. You know, he has a brain disorder. It's Tourette's syndrome. And it had never been diagnosed. So I asked them to take him to a, you know, a good hospital and get the test run, and it was Tourette's. So then we knew we needed to pray for physical healing. And I couldn't help but wonder how this little boy had been traumatized uh, by people praying for deliverance, and uh, he had no, no control. And I've ministered to other people in that area, and it's always been an organic problem, a natural biological problem. So the better part of wisdom is to be humble and not pretend that we know what to do. Uh, it's really important. Just in our humility, go to the Lord and say, Lord, you know, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to pray? What do you want to do in this person's life? Okay. Now... Let's talk about, I'll be talking about physical healing in the next period. So I want to just give a brief overview of these. And remember, they are interrelated always. And of course, uh, physical healing, we'll be talking about, Francis calls that good old physical healing. He loves to pray for people for physical healing uh, because he is very gifted and he sees a lot of healing, but he just loves people and can't stand to see them suffer. Now, in the area of inner healing, uh, this has been something that's uh, been my life work. This is where someone, going back to Isaiah 61, healing the brokenhearted. Uh, we all have a broken heart over something in our lives. Some had horrible childhoods, extremely dysfunctional, uh, serious, severe wounds from childhood. And the good news is, is that Jesus, who's the same yesterday, today, and forever, is not bound by time or place like we are, or like a therapist is, and he can reach into our lives at any stage of our life, all the way back to conception, and bring healing. And he's so beautiful in that, what he does. 
and I'll say a little more about this in the next period, but Jesus never did the same thing twice. He never prayed for people the same way twice, did he? He was so creative in his prayers. And that's because of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God, I can't remember ever praying for a person the same way twice. But again, what we tend to do is if this prayer worked for you, then I'm going to try it on you. You know, see what I'm saying? And so Jesus always, when he comes to people for inner healing and comes in their memories or God the Father comes into that traumatic memory, and I won't go too deeply into this because I'm teaching about it tomorrow, but Jesus always does something new and creative. And I've learned to let him take over in that. I don't, I don't guide prayers. I don't use guided imagery. Just try and find the trauma, the broken memory, get the person in a place with the Lord for healing, and let him present himself to them. And uh, what he does is extraordinary. Now, if they have a broken heart, wounded memories, damaged emotions, the chances are there's going to be some physical illness coupled with that. Because our body is not meant to contain the pain that most people carry. Uh, the anger, the suppressed or repressed anger, the grief. I'm struck every time we go somewhere for a conference and we have a healing service, how much grief is under the surface in most people. You know, just you start the prayer, the Holy Spirit comes, and they'll start crying. And we work with leaders, and it's the same with leaders. We had a, a leader recently, we have people coming and going at CHM all the time. And within 10 minutes of being with him, he started telling me about the problems that they're having with their daughter and uh, asking for prayer and asking for help. It's like there's so much grief in, in our culture and there's extreme anger. You see this, don't you? Shootings at McDonald's, at the post office, you know, wherever. Random college campus violence. There's so much anger in people. And this is not meant to be contained within us. It's meant to be talked about, dealt with, given to the Lord. And that's the whole area where our inner problems can affect our physical condition. It can also open the door for the enemy. Ephesians says, be angry but sin not and don't let the sun go down on your anger or you'll give the devil a foothold. Now, we, could, we spend in a level four school about five talks on the emotions. That tells me that we're not meant to contain anger within our bodies, within our minds, or it will make us sick or it will open the door for the enemy. And uh, it gives us a time frame. You have a day to deal with it. And when I deal with people, it goes all the way back to their childhood, usually, or to their first marriage, something like that. And there's still, so you can see how these emo the illnesses can be psychogenic. It can start in our emotions. It can start in our broken memories. Linda and I were praying up in Michigan at a, we had this conference for a few years called Journey to Healing. Linda and I were praying uh, for healing for this uh, woman. Well, actually, we weren't praying for healing for her. She came up, and she was a prayer minister. And she was attending the conference to learn more about healing. And she was angry. She said, I'm really angry. And I, you could see it. I mean, there was, you know, she didn't have to tell us she was angry. She kind of looked at it. And uh, I said, well, who are you angry with? And she said, this woman that I prayed for. And I thought, okay, this is a new one. I've never had anybody come to me. <laughs> as a prayer minister. And Linda and I were looking at each other like, how do we, how do we go forward? You know, because we had a lot of people we were praying for and we couldn't get into a counseling session. And I said, can you tell me in one minute why you're angry? And she said, I was visiting a nursing home as part of a healing team. There was a young woman there that had cirrhosis of the liver and she was dying. 
And we prayed for her, and God gave her a new liver. Total creative miracle. Brand new liver. She was instantly healed, instantly restored. Discharged her. This woman was an alcoholic. And guess what she did? She started drinking again. This woman was furious with her. She said, I prayed for her, God healed her, and she's out drinking. I said, okay. (laughs) What are we going to do, you know? And I said, let me tell you what you didn't do. You didn't pray for inner healing. You didn't pray for deliverance. Chances are, if she's been an addict a long time, there's some demonic activity. If she's an alcoholic, it's generational. And it's also a need for inner healing. And she said, oh, oh, well, I made a mistake. Okay. And she was totally okay with that then. And she turned around to leave. We didn't even pray with her. (laughs) She just turned around to walk away. And one of us said, where are you going? She said, I'm going to find her, you know? (laughs) Because it's like she'd never been taught that there's more ways to pray. So this woman still had a spiritual sickness. So I want to say a little bit about the spiritual sickness, a need for that. And it's what I was talking about yesterday with a fractured will. When a person can't simply repent and get out of sin, when they can't just simply repent and get out of an addiction, out of an affair, whatever it is, there's a spiritual sickness there. And it's rooted somewhere in sin and a need for repentance, but it's also a need for healing. Jesus needs to come and bring healing into their spirit. David talked about uh, in the Psalms, you know, crushed spirit, you know, who can bear. And uh, it's all through scripture, really. And we've kind of dealt with that through confession, but it is one step further than confession. It's an actual healing of the spirit and the wounds of sin. Uh, When I teach on forgiveness, one of the things that I believe the church needs to go further in is when someone repents or confesses, they actually have to be prayed for for the wounds of that sin to be healed. Because sin wounds the person that's doing it, and it wounds the person that they're sinning against or they've sinned against God. So a spiritual sickness is a real need for deep deep healing uh, in addition. And it's usually coupled with the other kinds of healing, of course. When the church says repent, it's not enough. It has has to go more. Okay, let's see, let's let's talk about, I'm not gonna talk about physical healing kind of in depth because that's the next period. Let's talk a little bit about evil. Uh, as I said, this isn't an area of our humanity, but it's where Satan attaches to our humanity. And he can attach on any of those three levels we just talked about. On the level of the spiritual, through sin, he gets his entrance through sin. Uh, he can attach in the emotions or the inner healing because he comes through the trauma because they're spirits of trauma. Uh, And he can also attach to our bodies. Uh, Jesus talked about a spirit of infirmity. You know, and we're not sure exactly what that means, but we know infirm means sick. You know, so a spirit of infirmity uh, can cause sickness in our bodies. And there can be spirits that attach to cancer and different things. It can be something like despair you know, hopelessness, there's all kinds of things that can attach when someone is very, very ill. Spirits of pain, uh, those are all levels on the physical order. In the emotional order, it can be spirits of anger, spirits of grief. Spirit of fear is a huge one that loves to attach on the emotional level. But just to say, we will be talking about spiritual warfare later, but this whole area of, of the evil As I said, Jesus dealt with evil all the time. Uh, He encountered Satan personally, and he encountered him when he was casting demons out of people. And 
I want to make this very clear because I am a psychologist. There's a distinct distinction, separation, class, whatever you want to call it. Mental illness is not the same as the demonic. Okay, and I want to say that very clearly because I've seen a lot of people kind of make that mistake. Where Satan gets started in someone that is mentally ill or depressed or has some of the addictions that are out there is the person becomes vulnerable to demonic attacks because of the weakness in their, their emotions, because of the weakness in their mind, whatever you want to say, in the generations. And all of this that I'm talking about, and we'll talk about generational healing tomorrow, all of this can pass down through the generations. All of it. Demons pass down, they get a stronghold in the generations. I prayed with one um, mother, she came to see me a few years ago. And this was a really interesting, uh, Frances and I both dealt with her and her husband. Uh, her little boy, they didn't allow guns in the home, uh, even toy guns. You know, she was, it was a wonderful Christian home, wonderful parents. The little boy would go out and get sticks. You know, little, little boys, little girls don't do those things. Oh. <laughs> Another need for healing, yeah. And he would point it to his head and say, I'm going to kill myself. And the mother would take it away from him, and this went on for a period of time. And finally, when she came to see us and talked to us, I kept hearing the Lord say, ask her, ask her about her father. And uh, I'd ask her about her father, and she wouldn't tell me anything. And we, we t it took a while, but the Lord kept saying, stay, be persistent, stay, stay with that. Finally, she admitted that her father had committed suicide with a gun and to his head. And his father committed suicide with the same gun. And the grandfather's brother, all with the same gun. And this came down through the generations. So you know what my first question was? Where is that gun? Where is that gun? You know, that gun has passed down through generations and done enough damage. And her husband, they had the gun. Her husband took the gun and dismantled it and buried it like, you know, 50 miles away from each other, that it will never be a gun again. We didn't even pray with the little boy. We did a generational Eucharist or communion, and we closed the door on that spirit of suicide because that's what was coming down through the generations. And this little boy, I mean, he's like four years old, was acting it out already. And... She never told him that he'd been prayed for, and he stopped doing that. <laughs> and he's a missionary today. Aww. Yeah, yeah, serving the Lord in a beautiful way, a beautiful young man. So the demons get started in the generations. Physical problems get started in the generations, and emotional ones do. And so this is where it starts to feel like, how can anyone ever be healed? <laughs> doesn't it? I know, some of you are thinking that. <laughs> I'm a therapist, I know that. Yeah. But the good news is, you're not doing the healing, you're not doing the discerning, you're, you know, the Holy Spirit is going to tell you what you need to know when you're with that person and you're praying. And if they're interconnected, he's going to show you that. And it will take several prayer sessions for certain people, Okay. But these are all interconnected. Now, every now and then, you'll get someone who will say, I was at a car accident. You know, uh, my neck was shattered. And, but even that, I'll tell you one quick story on this, and then we'll break. I was praying with a woman. We were doing a conference. Francis loves to get people up front and pray for them. You know, and I'm always like, are you sure you want to do that? You know, because everybody can tell whether they're healed or not. You know, can't we just take them outside? And, you know, he has such childlike faith, is what Linda says. It's childlike, strong faith. 
But anyway, he got this woman up, and she couldn't turn her head at all. Her neck was just locked in a position. And he just has so much faith for that. We call him the back doctor because he's really gifted in praying for necks and backs. And I love that because I get my neck out sometimes. But anyway, this woman, uh, we prayed. It was from a car accident. Uh, she had been went through an intersection. Somebody ran a red light, slammed right into the door. And uh, she hadn't been able to move her neck since then, really. Well, we prayed and prayed and prayed, and nothing really seemed to happen. And so there was another woman sitting in another chair that had breast cancer. So Francis moved on to her. And we were going to get prayer ministers to come with the lady with the stiff neck. And I started to go to the lady with cancer with him, and the Lord said, go back to her. And he said, you missed something. And I said, oh. So I went back over and I knelt down, and I said, Lord, what, what is it? He said, pray for the trauma of the car accident. Not the physical trauma, the emotional trauma. So I kind of leaned into her and I said, this is what the Lord is saying. I want to pray an inner healing prayer with you. And she said, great, whatever that is. You know, she didn't really know. So I said, can you remember the accident? And she said, oh, yeah, well, when we started praying, she remembered in vivid detail the fear she felt when it was coming at her. She heard the crashing. She heard the screeching brakes that she'd slammed on the brakes and he'd slammed on the brakes. Just all of that, the pain, she felt blood. She was really back there in that memory. So we prayed for the memory for Jesus to come and comfort and be in that memory. And I didn't even pray for her neck again. And she started going like this right after the prayer. Well, everybody now, they've been watching Francis pray for the woman with cancer. Now they're all looking at her. The whole audience is going, she's moving her neck. You know, <laughs> like I couldn't see that. She's moving her neck. I said, I know, she's moving her neck. And she just kept going. I couldn't even do what she was doing with her neck. It was totally healed. Totally healed. And the next morning, we were having breakfast. This was at a conference center. And she came in. And she came over to the table to say, I'm so thankful for what God did. And uh, I said, how's your neck? And she said, well, it's great, but the muscles are really reacting now because I haven't moved my neck in so long. So we prayed for her again, just for the, you can imagine, start using a muscle you haven't used for 10 years, you know. So even in physical, good old physical healing, there can be trauma uh, sealed in the memory of the accident. So anyway, let's take a break now. It's 1030. Um, stretch. So you don't need prayer later. <laughs> Walk around. We'll come.